I hope everyone had a good time at the Penguin Dinner last night, uh, for those who attended. I think it was fairly enjoyable. Um, I'd just like to give um, one quick mention once again to Mary Gardner, uh, the recipient of the Rusty Wrench Award last night. Uh, I think if we could just give her another round of applause for her fantastic efforts, that'd be great. So a few quick things for the day. I'll start off with the most completely boring thing that an announcer can do and state that if you own car UUW152 in the car park, your lights are on. Um, uh, okay, a couple of announcements. Um, the raffle will be drawn this afternoon. Um, today and this morning in particular is your last chance to get tickets for that fantastic MakerBot. Um, so we'll be drawing that in the closing session today. Um, the lightning talks will be starting at 3.20 today, um, and we'll be advising in a second who won those. Uh, sorry, the, the lightning talks, yeah, 3.20. Um, the best ofs will be announcing just in a moment who won those. Uh, the photo clomp closes at 1 o'clock. Um, please have all your entries in uh, by then. We will be advising who the winner of that one is uh, in this closing session as well, and there's a, a pretty great prize for them. Um, I've been asked to, to advise that the LCA, Birds of a Feather, is in Studio 2 at lunchtime for anyone silly, uh, brave enough to want to think about running an LCA. Um, it, it's very rewarding, I promise. Um, there will be a feedback survey going out. <laughs> uh, there will be a feedback survey going out to everyone. Um, if we could get you to, to fill that one out, it does help improve LCA year upon year. Um, a couple of other little things. Um, there is a love barbecue tomorrow uh, the, for Linux users Victoria. Uh, I believe the details were being handed out as you came in the door, so we'd love to, to see as many people at that as possible. Um, the weather today, 26, partly cloudy, wind 15 to 20 kilometres an hour, probably the most comfortable day we've had all week, which is a which is nice way to end. So, the votes are in for the best ofs, and we have... Four amazing talks from four amazing speakers happening this afternoon. <laughs> Having not seen any talks this week, um, I, I'm really relying upon feedback that I see on Twitter and from, from people that I speak to in the corridors. Uh, these are the four talks and these are the four names that I've heard the most throughout the week. So it's great to see that the voting does line up with those. Um, yeah, that they'll be kicking off at 20 past three this afternoon, uh, and that will be published on the schedule fairly shortly. 20 past one, sorry. Um, okay, we have just a couple more prizes to give away too. Um, give me away first. We have the final of these Intel SSDs. Do we have in the crowd an Anne Day? Ooh, there's Anne, thank you. <laughs> whilst Anne's making her way to the front. I'll say that we have a final Samsung Galaxy Tab to give away this morning with screen protector. <laughs> well done, Anne. And the winner of the Tab is Andrew Cowie. <laughs> Don't forget your screen protector! Quick! You cannot save the world without a screen protector. <laughs> so, we are of course here this morning for our final keynote of Linux.com Today U 2012. Uh, and standing beside me is, is that keynote speaker. Um, he's a renowned internet security professional uh, who works for the University of Washington uh, in their security and privacy laboratory. He's a core developer for the Tor project, which I'm sure most of you would be familiar with. Uh, he was part of the team behind the cold boot attacks um, and won a Pawnee for the most innovative research award. Uh, he was also part of the MD5 collision team uh, that managed to create a rogue CA certificate. Um, he is Mr. Jacob Applebaum.
first I'll start off by plugging in my laptop so you can see the presentation that I worked on until late into the evening. Huh? Maybe not. Set up this. Ah! It's a live demo fail already. Okay. So I'm here to talk to you today about surveillance and censorship. And it's quite an honor to be invited all the way down here. It was quite a long trip. Um, I had the opportunity to visit several airports along the way. I never knew that when I went to Australia, that meant I would also visit Los Angeles. So thanks for that. Thanks for bringing me here. Um, I really appreciate that. Um, I wonder, are there any DSD agents in the audience? If you could just raise your hand. Anybody? Come on, be proud of it. You know? Expose their secrets, protect your own. Um, so I want to start by saying that what Bruce Perrin said on his keynote is really right on, which is that free software is really important. And specifically, Richard Stallman's ideas and what he's been writing about, he's a genius. I mean, someone asked me yesterday if I was on a crusade, and I said, no, I'm not religious. But I realized if we had a prophet, it would be RMS. And, and specifically, I realized it in a sort of, oh, shit, we're doomed sort of sense, right? So we just know that he's really good at telling us how doomed we are. And he has some ideas about what we might be able to do to make it a little bit more livable. But it's, it's certainly not the case that he has come up with a bunch of perfect solutions. In fact, what he did is he came up with some ideas that allow us to maybe find a good first approximation of some solutions. So it's, I think, pretty different than a religious zealot. But there are definitely some parallels that make me think maybe I should call up Robert Anton Wilson and ask him what I should believe in. But um, <clears throat> that said, Richard Stallman is really important. And if you use the term open source software, I would really urge you to use the term free software instead. Because free software is about freedom. I know that Bruce likes to talk about how important it is to put on a suit and tie and to talk about business and so on. But the thing is that at the end of the day, we have to talk about what we want those businesses to actually accomplish. And what I want to see those businesses accomplish is to actually promote human rights and to actually make the world a better place. Right? So free software for freedom, not open source for business solutions. And I think that's really important. They can coexist together, but free software for freedom is the goal. We're allies, but we should always keep that in mind. And so that's sort of the opener there. And from that, I'm going to jump in, and I'm going to talk about some really bad news. So basically, we live in a surveillance society. I said state. And the reason is because we don't really live in different states. We live in maybe little different surveillance cones. And those different surveillance cones, they usually trade with each other. Some of you have probably heard about a thing called Echelon. Anybody here? Raise your hand if you have. Yeah, of course, right? Um, so the UK-USA pact, right? This idea that you know, the United Kingdom, Canada, um, New Zealand, Australia, these, these countries, they work together, they spy on each other's citizens, and they trade that information. Because it would be illegal for them to spy on their own citizens. So it's kind of a hack, right? So the thing is that what that practically means is that we live in a surveillance planet, right? The whole planet is surveilled in different ways. And I think that's really concerning to me. And I hope it's concerning to everybody else. Now, what can we do about that? Um, well, I'm not sure, but I'm going to get there. First, I'm going to talk a little bit about what, what it means to live in a surveillance state. So in 1785, Jeremy Bentham talked about this idea of the panopticon. And he, he said, you know, here's a prison where you can have a single guard in the middle, and every prisoner feels like they're being watched. So they actually become their own guards. So he observed hundreds of years ago that it was the case that when people felt like they were being surveilled, their behavior would be modified. That's a really important observation to make, because it shows, in fact, that even hundreds of years ago, we were able to, to see that this was the case before we had countless studies that actually showed that that's the case. So if we fast forward a couple hundred years, we can actually see what the Panopticon looks like, at least in the United States. <laughs> right? I mean, it started off small, and it got big, and it got worse. And I'm going to talk about that. So this is San Francisco. They, the AT&T ran a really great campaign. Right? AT&T works in more places like NSA headquarters, for example. <laughs> the Billboard Liberation Front liberated this in San Francisco. It was this, it was this afterwards. Um, this is important because AT&T collaborated to perform what generally we would consider to be an illegal action, which is that they wiretapped the entire traffic 
internet traffic and telephone traffic going through a bunch of their exchanges. We know that it happened at Second and Folsom in San Francisco because Mark Klein, an employee of AT&T, told the world. And we know that this is happening because the EFF, you know, speaking of other amazing people, the EFF spoke up and filed suit about this. And the US government said, well, you know, it's not really a problem because everybody was wiretapped, so nobody was really harmed. <laughs> right. So. I don't know about you guys, but I find that to be pretty disturbing. In fact, I find it to be so disturbing that I, you know, I felt quite sad. You know, Obama said that he was going to uh, close Guantanamo Bay and he was going to do a bunch of other stuff like hold the Bush administration accountable for you know, their crimes against humanity. Well, you know, warrantless wiretapping and general warrants, it pales in comparison to being murdered by US bombs, no question. But the fact of the matter is, Obama hasn't even done anything about this. And that's really sad to me. And I, I want to like the guy, but I don't anymore, which is too bad. And this, this pretty much is something that I feel like everyone has to deal with this, but nobody really understands how bad the problem is. Partially because, just as the US said that no one was harmed, they also say that they're not going to tell anybody how it was done. So for example, it is, it is certainly the case that other intelligence agencies in other countries also spy on their own at least the edges. For example, in Sweden, the FRA law says we get to wiretap the borders of the country, and then they get to do analysis on it. Now, Sweden is unique in that they actually codified this in law. So they said, we're going to wiretap everybody, and it's a law, and we're going to tell you how it works. Now, that's quite a nice dedication to the rule of law, but there's something to be said about how it's still tyranny, even if it's legal. And, and I think that that's also an important point. So here's how it happened in, in, in the United States. This is the splitter that they put into a room. This is the room. This is the, another view of the room. So just to go back. So it doesn't take much to be able to wiretap San Francisco. And that's really important, especially because this is you know, a major center of the internet in terms of what people are doing online. So everybody that visited something that transited through San Francisco or any of the other NSA TNT locations, they probably went through a room like this. We only really know about this room for sure, and we only have pictures of this one. I'd like to have better pictures if you happen to work in one of these facilities anywhere, especially in Australia. You should take these pictures and you should make sure to very carefully conceal your identity and post them online so that people know about it. I think that's really important. So <clears throat> another thing that I think is important is to counter a sort of 90s nihilism. If I was, if I was gonna you know, have to point it out, I think that would probably be the way to frame it which is that people like to think that they, uh, they don't have anything to hide. And I think that's pretty fantastic, um, specifically because it usually comes from a position of privilege. You hear it in the geek community a lot, like, oh, I don't like to be political. What they mean is, I'm OK with the status quo, usually because they're white male, and they're making it, and they're loaded with cash. <laughs> Almost every lady clapped except for Karen. Come on, Karen. Oh, okay. Right. She opened by saying she had a big heart. I was going to open by saying I have a large mouth. <laughs> we all have our special organs. <laughs> so <clears throat> that, that one's mine. <clears throat> so I think it's really important to note that we don't have to think about it in the terms of it not happening to you. It's happening to you right now. So for example, who here has a cell phone? Raise your hand if you have a cell phone. Congratulations. As the senator said last night, you have a tracking device that can make phone calls. Right? That's the way to recontextualize it. For example, he also said last night that while he was reviewing the wiretapping for this country, he said that there's been you know, a couple thousand requests for content of information. And that sounds maybe right for the size of the population. But he said that there's also been a quarter of a million requests for so-called metadata. So that's like your location, for example, where you are right now. So everybody in this room could be covered in that and they could be getting your data in real time. Maybe that counts as one. I think that that's pretty, that's pretty crazy, but it doesn't include the spy agencies. So that means it doesn't include your equivalent of the NSA. That's really scary to think that 250,000 of those requests went out last year. I mean, it's probably the case that you are actually, someone in this room, certainly me, is definitely, <laughs> is definitely up here. And with the fact that the borders are surveilled, Everybody when you transit, you know, who used a root name server that wasn't in Australia today? Raise your hand. Yeah, okay, congratulations, you were probably surveilled too. And this is, I mean, this is a really important thing. It's like, okay, who cares about it? Well, it turns out that, that Dr. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's good. <laughs> All right, 
So Dr. Kelly Kane from the, uh, from the University of Indiana, who I love dearly, is totally fantastic. She talks about this in terms of how people cope with the psychology of being surveilled. And I'm not going to go too much into her research, but just an interesting point is that people actually do this as a coping strategy. If you recognize it's a coping strategy, it's not unlike how a lot of women have to deal with abuse in the technical community, which is total bullshit and they shouldn't have to deal with it. And it's really important to note that this is a coping strategy that we take when our state abuses us. We say, oh, it's not going to happen to us, or oh, I don't have anything to hide. But the thing is, we all have something to hide. Who here decided this morning they weren't going to come to this talk naked? Well, why is that? It's because you want to have control over your own body. Yeah, it's cold. Well, <laughs> that's great. You shouldn't be too worried about what you look like when it's cold. <laughs> People will love you anyway if you're a good person. But this kind of privilege is something I think that, that we have to really examine, right? We need to have a consciousness raising moment, right? After September 11th, all the governments of the world just got together and said, gosh, we've got to do something about this. I know what we'll do. We'll fight against this thing, which is really bad. And then a new thing happened, which is there's an emergent phenomenon of this kind of structure, is that it attracts assholes, right? When you build a structure like this, for the best of intentions, it actually attracts people that wish to abuse them. So it is the case, from what I understand about the Echelon, all right, from what I understand about the Echelon investigation by Duncan Campbell, that the NSA, through the State Department, gave Boeing a number to bid when bidding against Airbus. So the state surveillance mechanism was used in corporate espionage so that Boeing could win, because what's good for Boeing is good for America, so that they could win a bid against Airbus. That's crazy to think of it being used that way. But it wasn't created for that. It was created so that people could stay secure and maybe safe from some serious violence. But we, we can't forget that just because it was created maybe for a good reason, that it will be used very seriously for things that we definitely don't want it to be used for. For example, who here has heard of Martin Luther King? I'm sure all of you, right? Who here knows that the FBI wiretapped him, sent him a tape of him talking. Anybody know this? Yeah? Okay. Who here knows that they then sent a follow-up letter that urged him to commit suicide and then they would not release the tape? And then they shot it. Well, yeah. So <laughs> this is important though. The FBI was not set up to do that. In fact, they did it as part of the COINTELPRO program and the reason that they did it, they said, they set this program up was to fight against communism and external forces, supposedly. But it's really important to realize that this, it wasn't created with bad intentions, but oh boy, during the civil rights mu movement, was it really used against people who were fighting for their very lives. And this is, I think, I mean, to me, it's so repulsive that the FBI did this. They were caught, the church committee came out and, and actually, you know, had quite a, a lot of discussions with people about it. And, and, you know, they really thought they were doing the right thing. I mean, most of the racist guys thought they were really, really doing the right thing which is kind of scary. But the thing is that it's not that you're necessarily going to fall into this because of your everyday life. You're going to fall into it because they decide you're a terrorist or because in trying to get terrorists, they're going to grab you too. And when you associate with those people, they're going to get you. And they really will do it. I promise you. It has happened to me. And it can happen to you, especially if you had breakfast with me this morning. <laughs> so, but, but people like to think about it in terms of this, this idea, um, this so-called lawful interception. So there's different barriers for entry for wiretapping people, um, which in case you were wondering what that means, it's uh, spying, right? Just to clear that up, right? Wiretapping, spying, that's what it means. So this so-called lawful intercept, they say that it makes us safer. They say, well, you know, if we don't have this, we won't know what's going on. The reality of the situation, though, is that for most of civilized humanity, we have seen a balance of power. This is an expansion of the balance of power in a gigantic way. The 20th century saw a lot of this as well. You know, it was the case that 150 years ago, passports were, eh, you know, sort of a nice thing to have, but not necessary. The First World War and the Second World War really solidified this idea of one true identity. And we see that this, you know, wiretapping is the idea that they have the right to watch you at any point when they decide, usually without a court order. In the United States, there are definitely cases where they say, we just want this metadata, which is not the same as content, so we should be able to have that without a warrant. That's pretty concerning when you consider that what metadata is in aggregate is content. 
Right? Metadata in aggregate shows the story of your life. It shows where you've been. It shows what you've said. It shows who you've talked to. It shows your friends. It shows your friends' friends. You draw a graph. You know who to assassinate. And that's what my country excels at. I don't know if you've heard about it, but lately we actually killed a 16-year-old boy in Yemen because his dad happened to be a preacher for Islam on YouTube. Right? With a drone. 16-year-old boy. Boom. Dead. No trial. Right? So when you think about the fact that the US president asserts that that's the case, I mean, it used to be that we had a joke, would you rather live under American domestic policy or American foreign policy, and now there's no difference. So I think it's important to remember the, the, the only way to win that game is not to play it. Right? You don't want to try to, to beat Obama at that assassination game. But what we should do is make it harder for people to be targeted like this, because we know that the state will use its power in this way, because it does use its power in this way. So, for example, so-called you know, so lawful intercept, these devices like telephone switches, they build into them the ability to wiretap someone. So some people actually took control of these Greek Vodafone switches, and they wiretapped the prime minister and a bunch of members of parliament. And then they, maybe they or the operator who ran the switch was found uh, hanged to death in his apartment. So the operators, who here operates telephone switches? Anybody? Think about how much your life is worth, really and truly, honestly, and know that if you are the centralized point of failure, someone may use your access against you in a pretty nasty way. And one way to reduce that risk would be to make sure that your devices cannot do these things, because then your privilege will not be used against you in a really nasty way should the value of doing that exceed the value of your life to people that can do these types of things. It's really important not to build that kind of weakness in, especially because usually when these devices are built, it is also said that the people that operate them aren't supposed to know that the wiretapping is happening. It's supposed to be in secret. There's not any transparency, and there's not any accountability. Usually, they, we rely on their reports to count what a wiretap is. I don't know about you, but I don't think that the government is very good at self-regulation in secret. In fact, the entire idea behind democracy is that it sucks at that and that we have to be accountable, and we have to take control of that in order to make sure that it does the right thing. And so the Athens affair, I think, is really great. There's an article in the IEEE magazine, and it actually is many, many pages long, and it outlines how they did this. We still don't know who did this. That's a pretty incredible thing, considering that the prime minister of a country was actually wiretapped by whoever did this. Um, so what's the purpose of all this, right? I mean, really and truly, if we look at authoritarian states, it really comes down to these three points. Control, enforcement of certain power structures, for example, patriarchy, that's a big one, and harassment. I mean, I personally have been harassed by the US government landing in the United States so many times like, that I, I, I have lost count, right? Where they seize my electronic devices and then I can't talk about it. Where they threaten me with prison for the rest of my life for being friends with Julian Assange. And then, you know, let me know that I'll be subtly raped in prison for the rest of my life. Right? That's the kind of general jackassery you can sign up for when you sign up to work with the DSD, too, probably. So <laughs> consider maybe you don't want to do that. And in fact, the surveillance industry is so ridiculously arrogant. Um, Tatiana Lucas, who runs a little uh, sort of homebrew surveillance shop, um, they have a conference called ISS World Intelligence Support Solutions. I registered and I went last year, which was really that was a, an incredible event. I mean, of all the conferences I've ever been to, that was definitely the one where I felt like I was dressed like in a very strange way. You know, I bought some new clothes to look like the people that are there. I felt like Hunter S. Thompson, but without the acid. And <laughs> so the Wall Street Journal wrote about ISS World, and um, she wrote in and said a bunch of things, but specifically this. The article, Document Trove Exposes Surveillance Methods will have a negative effect on job creation in the US, as attention of this kind makes US manufacturers gun shy about developing and eventually exporting anything that can remotely be used to support government surveillance. So she was basically saying that it's OK that the Nigerian government is attending this, even though the Nigerian government sends death squads to kill workers who organize for workers' rights at Chevron Texaco stations and, and oil refineries. It's OK that they use it. It's all right. It's totally fine. And it's good for the American economy that they do that. Well, I say, I don't think so. I think that's bullshit, right? Just like when IBM built punch cards and adding machines for the Nazis, and they actually knew that they were going into places like Auschwitz, and they custom built them. They wrote the software, the equivalent of software, 
They have culpability in it. These guys try to suggest that it's like a fork. No, what it's like, it's like a knife, and you stand next to the person and you teach them how to more effectively stab someone in the heart. Right? That's not okay. And when people do these types of things and they try to say it's just in the name of business, we have to take a step back and we have to say, you know, you guys are actually not good simply because you say that you like the police. I mean, there's, there's certainly legitimate law enforcement that exists, but just because they have the money to attend your conference, that doesn't mean that those are those good people and that their actions are good simply because they are in a government, a government somewhere in the world. So I want to give you an example here. So I, um, I happen to um, have come into uh, contact here with a, can you hear the audio of this? This is a man in the middle device from a company that sells man in the middle related stuff. So they, they actually do attacks. You install this into the core of the ISP. So here's the server room. I don't know who they did, uh, who, got, who they got to do this video, but it's like seriously, hilariously bad. Okay, so check this out. ISP analyzes traffic for easy target identification. Identification, this is really important to keep in mind. Okay, so the target's using free software, so maybe, oh wait, it's not free? That's proprietary software. I have mixed feelings now. Maybe they deserve to get owned. But you see, they pretend to be iTunes, they exploit a vulnerability, and then they take over the machine. So, you know, this guy can be using Tor or anything. And look at that, they've rootkitted his machine. Yeah, so the thing is that I don't want to live in a world where the government can do that to me all the time. Do you? I, I can't believe that that's not a unanimous no, but really? No? Do you want to live in a world where the government can do that to you? No. Yeah, okay, thanks. I was just wondering about that. So the thing is that these guys sell all kinds of products that are specifically tactically, uh, tactically designed to break into people's computers. And you think, oh, well, it's not so bad, you know, because there are like terrorists and child pornographers. This is the office of the Amandala in Egypt. Um, a friend of mine in Egypt put these photos online. Um, well, gosh, what is that? You know, I don't know. I can't read Arabic very well. Oh, look at that. It's the sales receipt from Finn Fisher's uh, parent company, Gamma, and they're se selling it. Customer ID, Egyptian SSD. Hmm, probably not a solid state drive. Probably the Secret Service, I would imagine. And what is it? Well, they paid some, you know, 287,000 euros for this FinFly stuff. Actually, interesting to note is this is built on Backtrack, which is built on free software. So free software for oppression in this case. Um, so what they use this for is actually breaking into activist computers. The, the people that did this, they put people in dark holes without a trial for a decade at a time. They torture them and they murder them. So these guys, there's a trickle-down effect, basically. And the trickle-down effect is that we have a legitimate reason, one legitimate reason, and then these guys buy it because it exists. You know, the Egyptian Secret Service is not going to be able to build a Finn Fisher-like system. They just don't have the people to do that. And even if they did, they've got other things that they need to do. So here's another example. This is from 2005. This is Naris. Um, this is one of their main, uh, main sales guys. And he was going to Egypt during the time of the dictatorship to sell surveillance technology to their main telecoms. That's a pretty questionable thing to do considering the fact that it is a military dictatorship. Um, you'll also know that NARS is the company that worked with AT&T and the NSA to do surveillance. So after they wiretapped the United States, they went on to sell their products in Egypt. So it really all ties together. But, but, but what does this have to do with Australia, right? Well, here's what it has to do with Australia. Is the senator here? Somewhere, yeah? Are you allowed to talk about, about any of their relationships? Probably. Well, we have to kill everyone in the room. Okay, right. <laughs> so, it's on live streaming, go for it, right. So, maybe he won't talk about it, I don't know. But my understanding is that what the Department of Defense and the DSD people have in common with Egypt is that they like to work with the CIA. Anybody hear about the CIA's extraordinary rendition program where they took people and they shuttled them to Egypt for torture by Omar Suleiman? Anyone? Raise your hand if you heard about that. Everybody that didn't raise your hand, my country kidnaps people and sends them to Egypt for torture. 
the CIA does that. And the CIA also works with the DSD. So you get, to, you get to, if you choose an illustrious career in whistleblowing, but you join there first, um, you can maybe find out how they were doing support for that kind of operation, which is not only certainly illegal in my country, it's definitely a violation of some basic human rights. So I think, you know, this is pretty scary when you realize that this and this tie together with that. It all works together because the state apparatus, the state security apparatus of each state works together in collaboration against us and very rarely for us when you consider the fact that most of the people that we know to have been kidnapped were just innocent. And certainly they had never had a trial, which is the important part. Because maybe some of those guys were really bad. But the fact of the matter is, without a trial, we have not established that as a matter of fact. And the rule of law is extremely important, but it has no meaning when there is no justice in the rule of law. And it is incredibly important to remember that. So instead of working on this and ending up with this, you're all familiar with the Stasi logo? Yeah. Consider that there's a better thing to do with your time, right? One of them is to resist censorship. For example, in Australia, there's a lot of discussion right now about blocking dentists' websites. I mean, um, I'm sorry, what I meant was a dentist website accidentally got on there. It was actually designed for something else. But um, really what it's about is lying to you. Right? When someone says that they're in favor of internet filtering, what they're actually saying is that they're in favor of you being ignorant and them having power to be your master. I reject that. I, I was really inspired, sort of also a little sad, but I was really inspired by this blood on the Southern Cross thing that I saw the other day. I mean, it was really great, except for that it didn't end very well for you guys. I'm really sorry to hear that you still have a monarchy. But... but when we had our Boston Tea Party and our American Revolution, we ended up not actually having a monarchy anymore. Um, yeah, you say that, but they dissolve your parliament in 1975, right? Um, and the same is true for uh, proroguing the Canadian parliament twice, thanks to the governor general in Canada in the last five years, too. Right? It is easy for people who are clearly part of the proletariat, that is all of us, to remember that the, the monarchy of any era was pretty irrelevant to the proletariat, right? Yeah, the queen's not going to step on you unless, you unless you do something to effectively step on the queen. But the reality is that free people don't have a monarchy, right? They rule themselves. There is no gods, no masters, right? And I think it's important to remember that. And so when people want to censor your internet, what they are saying is they wish to be your master. They wish to have secrecy. They wish to have the ability to know about this content but you're not allowed to know about this contact. They have the privilege, and you don't have the privilege, right? So for example, in China, the way that it works is they have a so-called Great Wall. Really, it's more of a spider web, and what it does is it, it blocks at different points, it inspects, it's like an automatic policeman. If we built our roads the way the Chinese and the rest of the world is building their internet, we'd have a camera and a microphone and a policeman on every corner watching everything we do as a prerequisite for building the road. So we, instead of expanding that kind of police power, we should consider that that's not the kind of world we live in in the, in, the, in the physical world without the internet. Why do we want, when we build a better world on the internet, a world where we can connect with everybody on the planet effortlessly, to learn, to understand, to connect with each other, to better understand the human condition, to improve the human condition, why would we then decide that the right thing to do is to install the fascist dictatorships that almost the whole planet has rejected? Hmm. I think the answer is because people use fear as a tactic for telling us that it is necessary, right? Ironically, the U.S. uses legal means. I heard this morning that, that rapid share was shut down and that mega upload, yeah, mega upload was shut down and that the CEO was arrested. That's crazy for sharing files that like this guy didn't even upload. I mean, it's amazing, but it gives you some idea, which is that sharing information is actually a kind of power which people are a little afraid of at times. And that's, that's, that's pretty incredible. We see it in, for example, the Middle East. The Lebanese ISPs actually use Squid, which is sad that they use free software, but it's good because it's unpatched. 
Um, Syria, <laughs> Syria uses off-the-shelf commercial products, so Blue Coat, for example, and they actually use commercial products, and those commercial products are custom-tailored for the Assad regime. This is a regime that uses machine guns to shoot civilians in the street. Right? It kind of reminds me a little bit of IBM during the Second World War, before and after. Right? They know it. They have culpability. They send engineers there. They understand what's happening in the press. When thousands of people are being murdered, you can't just say, well, I'm neutral. You can't be neutral on this moving train. It's not possible when you understand the context of that. And everybody going to Syria to work on these things understands that context. But every network is different. So for example, here with the DNS censorship, where corporations, except for example, this one, which seems to be a good one. Huh? They have just signed up because what they care about is making money and they don't want to be regulated, so they're willing to sell your freedom down the drain, except these guys. This is really important. You should support them. I met one of their engineers last night who begged me not to say his name on stage, um, but he really he gave me a, a, a sort of a good feeling because what he said is that he believed that the company would not do things like spy on users or censor users unless they were forced to do it. And that's really important because there are a bunch of companies that didn't say that. I mean, it's a low bar, right? But the fact that they didn't do that is important. And so one way we can support that directly is to use them instead. Because those guys are actually saying that they care about your privacy, your security, your integrity, and your ability to read, your right to read. Anybody here read Richard Stallman's right to read? It wasn't supposed to be a manual, <laughs> right? I mean, but it's important because what people are doing is they're blocking you from reading. They're stopping you from actually speaking. So for example, here are some you know, canonical you know, countries where you would expect it to be non-free. So this is the United Arab Emirates in the upper corner. This is Qatar. Over here is Kuwait. Over there, I think, is uh, Saudi Arabia. Right, so these are places you would expect to block the internet, right? Everybody expects them to do that. And, you know, in, in, for example, China, you know, if you use the word democracy in a TCP connection, it might get reset by their firewall, which is kind of an interesting thing to think about, right? Or, for example, in the United States, when they know there's going to be a protest, they pull the Mubarak and they pull the internet, like on the BART trains, where they pulled the internet connections and all the cell phones, including 911 service, which is pretty illegal. No one was held accountable for it, just like in the Mubarak regime. Um, but it's, it's fascinating because these different things, they're different taxonomies, but in this taxonomy of censorship, we can see that cutting off access is the most basic, simple form of censorship. And you know, keyword filtering is a little more selective. Like when Cisco tried to sell this equipment to China, they said, find you know, unwanted religious groups like the Falun Gong. Right? That was their selling point when they were selling this stuff to the Chinese government. I think Cisco maybe, maybe was doing the wrong thing there. What do you guys think? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, that's pretty. I mean, that's pretty crazy to think of it. So here we, you know, we're moving. A, we're moving a little further in here. So we've got some other countries. So you've got, um, I think, the top two. I think that those are on the Zane network in Kuwait, uh, and then one of these is in Bahrain on the left, and in the center, um, this is in the Sultanate of Oman. Uh, and again, I put another Saudi one up there just because I thought it looked, you know, color contrasty. It looked good. Um, the Sultanate of Oman is actually quite interesting because what they actually have is an old unpatched send mail system and you can um, put in there you know, the website you want to have reviewed. So I said, hey, could you unblock torproject.org? And uh, someone in Oman put in my email address and stuff. And they said, we have reviewed the site and uh, we have decided we will not unblock it. Um, okay, well, so we, we now know that the Middle East has some censorship. No surprise, right? Because this is just something that's totally obvious to us in non-free countries. On the left, we have Vodafone. On the right, we have O2. And in the center, we have T-Mobile. Those two are in the UK, and that's in the United States. So this is the website for the project that I work on. It's a free software project, right? So people can speak freely, so that they have the right to read, so that you can all, if you want to, visit this, download the software, and help other people to speak freely and to maintain their right to read. Yeah, so on the left-hand side, it's age verification. On the middle side, it's actually not just age verification, but identity verification. You want to be anonymous on the, uh, on the internet? Well, you're going to have to give us a bunch of information about yourself. And the same is true for O2. This is craziness. 
right? And not only that, for T-Mobile in the center, I mean, they are filtering a US company in one state, and they are a US company in another state. Generally speaking, if, if someone has, for example, a road and they are interfering with different uh, packages traveling from state to state in the United States, it's interfering with interstate commerce, and it's actually illegal to do that. So what business do these common carriers have doing that with legitimate companies? And the answer is they're rent-seeking fascists. <laughs> But real quick, I think it's important to talk about how this is not, it's not all equal. Website blocking is really easy to bypass, right? It's super, super simple. The problem is that when people start to see this kind of censorship, it finally starts to dawn on them. It starts to, to register in everybody's mind in a way that is undeniable that to censor, you have to inspect. And to make a decision about whether or not you will censor is actually a thing where you have to decide to surveil all of the things in order to look at what is inside each of the things you'd like to block, potentially. So that means people are waking up and realizing, hey, I can't reach this site. That's because I'm being spied on all day long. And that, I think, really causes people to sort of have this consciousness-raising moment where they realize that, but usually they censor themselves. They're a little more afraid, right? It's, 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 it's state-based terrorism when the state censors your internet and causes you to be afraid. They are terrorizing you into saying you have no right to know something, no right to read a thing. And it's funny because I think I'm more likely to encounter that in my life than I am to die in an airplane crash from a Muslim. We didn't build these security apparatuses so that we would not, um, you know, I guess we, we didn't build these things so that we would have to be in fear of our own state. It was supposed to be the case that we built them because they were people that challenged and threatened our supposed way of life. But it's gone way overboard. And it happens all over the place. First in the most authoritarian countries because they have no qualms about doing it and they've decided it's the right way. But then it happens in other places. Places where Occupy movements are happening, for example. Right? And the reason for that is because it challenges and threatens the status quo that exists even if it is totally nonviolent, as is the case with Occupy, unless you count the police that beat up on them, in which case it's not nonviolent at all. So in the United States, what we're trying to do is this SOPA Act, right? You all saw the blackout that happened a couple of days ago. You know, we've been against this kind of censorship from the very beginning at the Tor Project, but in general, the entire internet is against it, because what it says is that someone who has no relationship to our community will be able to just block and knock us offline probably without due process. And unless we can afford a lawyer, we don't actually have a chance to do anything about it. That's pretty scary. The fact that Google did this should really make people freaky. I mean, they should freak out about that, right? I mean, Google's main job, they might say it's to index the whole planet and to make everything searchable, but the reality is that they use the internet as their business model. And when they realize their business model is threatened by this, that should be really scary because their economic interests are huge in the United States. And for them to be afraid of this, I think, gives you some idea about what chance we as individuals will have standing up to laws like this, which is, I think, not much, actually. So we have to stop these things before they happen. So when, uh, is it Conway? Conroy? What? Yeah, when Conroy's government is telling you that he wants to censor the internet, and you know, when that happens, in your mind, what you should say is, what the hell are you talking about? Why would you do that? Why? Stop. No, that's crazy. Whatever the reason is, you're wrong. That's not the right answer. Don't do that. Let's find another way. And when they say that it will help, ask, what does it help with? Who does it help? What is the data that shows that it helps with something? Ask for the facts. I mean, I know it's hard to get facts out of politicians, but you can try. Alternatively, one of my favorite people in the whole world, Zuko of Zuko's Triangle and a bunch of other projects says, I want humanity to invent an internet that doesn't rely on the consent of any government. So yet, let's vote yes on SOPA. <laughs> I'm of the approach that we don't actually have to make things get really bad before we can make them much, much better. And I, I'd like to think that this is a, a, we don't need to go there. The good news is that if we go there, we will still have some agency to change things. So for example, in December of 2011, WikiLeaks released, along with many other partners, the spy files. And what the spy files show, if you, if you Google for spy files, you'll see it now. It shows a bunch of corporations 
that were willingly, like AIMSYS, spying on people in Libya, targeting journalists in the United Kingdom and in other places, willingly. Things that would be illegal to do in France, where the company is based, they did it in Libya, and the equipment was used and targeted. In fact, part of their pamphlets, where they're showing what the system is capable of, includes target lists of journalists working in other countries. So just, just imagine that for a second. That's unbelievable that they're doing this. And in fact, it's exactly like IBM, what they were doing during the Second World War, which is putting profit before people. And I think also part of this thing that is worth considering is that profit before people is not the right way to go about it. It's actually the opposite of that. So this is an example. By looking at these documents, by finding out these systems, figure out which ones are deployed in your country and in your city. Learn about them. Tell people about them, right? And now, finally, we can talk about the good news. Because that was a bunch of bad news. So now we can talk about something happy. Which is that we can fight surveillance with anonymity. Because as we know, it is the case that target identification is the core of the surveillance state, right? When they know that it's you, then they put a machine in your ISP that breaks into your machine. They send you a special SMS. They turn the microphone on your telephone on or something like this. But all of that starts with having an idea of who you are or how to retroactively search through data retention. All the logs that they have gathered, they have a huge haystack. They want to find the needle. The thing they do to find that needle is they identify you. And then from that, they draw graphs. From that, they draw relationships. They infer all kinds of information. And that is how they start. And what they do in the end is they detain you. They harass you. They harass your loved ones. And they, they go after you with a zeal that is usually reserved for people that have you know, done something supposedly quite terrible. But it used to be that they had a trial first. <coughs> And it used to be that you had to be a high-level intelligence officer to gather this kind of information. And now it's basically anybody that can afford to buy a deep packet inspection engine, which is you know, pretty serious. So I mean, it, it pains me to say it, but the law is the thing that protects us here. Because the state must be restrained from doing this kind of surveillance, because there's almost no hope otherwise. But there is some hope for the interim. And what that comes down to is, first of all, having the will to change things. For example, the anonymous pamphleteers of the American Revolution. The printing press, if you have to put a mark on a thing you have printed, it told the king's soldiers who had printed it. So they would go and shut that down. So being able to anonymously print things, which is very difficult even now, that was very powerful because you could speak truth to people and they couldn't shut down the speech. It was a very, very powerful example of anonymity, which is part of the reason that my country even exists. And in the 20th century, a great example is people that were anonymous, but they broke the law, and just as the anonymous pamphleteers did, they broke the law because it was necessary to do so. They broke into the FBI, and it was in Media, Pennsylvania, I believe, and they found all of the COINTEL profiles that showed things like Martin Luther King being wiretapped. Right? So if you live near a local police station that does surveillance, consider this. Right? <laughs> I'm not joking. No, no, seriously. It is our responsibility as human beings to make everyone's business our own business in this way. Right? If the state has all of this extreme power, we have to balance it out with some democratic oversight, some transparency, and some accountability. We give them power, but power accumulates in a way that is extremely difficult to get rid of. And when it is abused, it is very difficult to have justice. And this is something that we have to consider. What happened as a result of that was the church committee. Lots of people had a lot of trouble. The FISA courts were established. Many laws were established that said, this is not what the United States is about. Now, in the 80s, the FBI did it again. But this time, they had an accountability mechanism. So they really went quite hard against them. Unfortunately, after 9-11, all the cops just lost all of these restrictions, they think. And so they got away with it quite a lot. And I personally have only been visited by the FBI a couple times, um, and I told them to you know, take a walk. But this is not something that is special. Right? This, that happens probably to tens of thousands of Muslims in, in, in America every day. You know, how, does it, how does it feel for the people that are in the refugee camps in Australia? Right? If you are one of those people, you really want justice, and you really want transparency and accountability. You really want to make sure that you have some ability to make your situation better. So you should do that, but you really want to do it anonymously. Because boy, are you in trouble if they identify you. But here's a great example of this. 
Um, 14 years before Darwin's origin of the species, um, a person wrote the vestiges of the natural history of creation, which talked about a lineage, a biological, essentially he described a genetic lineage, totally blasphemous to the extreme at the time that this is published. People, of course, read it and they were interested in it, but there are many powerful interests that were very upset about it. By publishing it anonymously, in, in fact, almost with the basic remailer protocol, this person was able to stay safe and to send new editions and to actually correspond. He even went so far as to use um, his wife as a proxy. So she wrote his letters so people would not recognize his handwriting. So privacy is, in this way is, I think, quite important. And here we see that it's being used to discuss ideas that later turned out to be pretty reasonable theories. And it turns out that this was a theory that was not very popular at the time. And even in my country now, is still not very popular. <laughs> You gotta pick your battles. All right, so I'm gonna blow through the rest of these pretty quickly here. It's important to not disclaim our, our, our just total disdain with the world. It's important to not just say, you know, we have no ability to change this. So I wanna take a quick survey here. Who here uses free software? Raise your hand. Okay, keep your hand up if you, rate, if you write free software. Okay. Everybody that's raising their hand right now, if you were to decide, and for the people watching, that's about more than half the audience, if you, you can put your hands down. If every single one of the people that raised their hand at first decided to keep using free software and convince their friends to do so, we would be making the world a better place. That without question, when some jerk says to you, well, what are you doing to make the world a better place? Trying to put you down and, and to discourage you, you could say, oh, I help my friends to use free software for freedom. Right? And when people who raise their hand for developing the software, when you make choices that respect your user's privacy, when you make choices that keep people secure and safe, you have the same trickle-down effects just as any other industry does. Only instead of trickling down surveillance and human rights violations, you trickle down something that protects the user potentially from surveillance. So if you build a chat program, off-the-record messaging will maybe save somebody's life in a place where they didn't even know that they needed it. So what is this free software, right? The four freedoms. This is the key, right? If you have the ability to read the Free Software Foundation's website, especially for the people on the live stream, it's probably hard to read these slides. But it is important to know that these four freedoms are the core of what makes free software, right? The freedom to run the program, to study it, to redistribute it, to change it, and to distribute your changes to other people. And of course, doing this requires source code, right? But really, the reason to hack free software is because we are going to liberate our own machines. And when our machines are the interface to the world that we live in, for example, with Karen, she has a heart connected to proprietary software, right? I mean, it is really important to consider that she is also now really tied to the company that made that heart implant. What happens if it goes bankrupt? Boy, that's really scary. Or, for example, Johnson & Johnson has a heart stent where you know, it doesn't have a machine inside of it, but they decided it wasn't making them the money that they wanted. And even though millions of people have had these heart stents, they decided to stop making it, right? Because their profits come before people. Now, I don't know the exact perfect solution to this, but at least for devices that have software on them, the software and the hardware should be free, especially if they're being granted patents, which give them a limited monopoly, it should be limited, and it should be the case that the benefit that they created from the society they came from, which was possible because of that, that those companies should give back, just in the same way that society gave them the foundation to build that company and to build those devices, right? I mean, when you hire engineers, it's almost certainly the case that their education was in some way coming from all of the people, especially in places with public education. So the key here is that it's voluntary, and that when we have these, we can build alternatives. So we, I mean, who here remembers the days when you could not run free software on a laptop? You guys remember that? Okay. Oh my God, we live in a new world. I mean, it's not the year of the desktop. I hear next year is the year of the tablet. But, <laughs> but, it's, but it's important to note, it was the case that no one would have raised their hands some time ago. And it was certainly the case that, you know, for the entire computing world, we were stuck with proprietary software. When a vendor made a change, all of our lives could be ruined for a day or two, or maybe longer. And user, 
users without the ability to use a compiler. They would maybe have it even worse. They wouldn't be able to hack it. So when Richard Stallman talks about these machines really ruling our lives and then corporations that, that run those machines ruling those, you know, around us, essentially, we have to consider that, it, you know, unfortunately, he, he was right in what he said. But free software builds that alternative, and we are the ones that are responsible for building it and for building our community to build more free software. It will become a lot harder for these government guys to build back doors and break into your machine if, when they try, they fail because the software is more secure, or when they try, we catch them because we understand what's different about our machine that's been modified by someone else. You know, the, I look forward to the day that the only binary blob on any of my systems is the rootkit that the government has installed. <laughs> has anybody here ever heard of Bill Hicks? Yeah. All right, great, yeah. So you asked that in America, and Bill what? What? Right? <clears throat> So he, he said something that was great, you know? Instead of funding the military industrial complex, we could pretty much feed and clothe and give everyone an education on the planet. You know, and he, he said, you know, every person, not one person excluded. That's really, you know, part of the idea with free software, at least for me, as opposed to open source for building business, is that free software is about giving people the basic ability to do what we already have in the rest of our world, to use our own tools, to build things, to, to live our lives freely. And so, if we were to paraphrase them, if we were to paraphrase them, we could say basic human rights for everyone, not one person excluded. Right? That should be a core motivating goal. So, you know, when you help to build communication software, when you help to do things that help other people, we should consider it's for everyone. That's the idea of the four freedoms. And the asymmetry of the surveillance and the censorship industry, it's not working for that goal. That's really important to know. Freedom from surveillance means we're free from self-censorship. Freedom from actual censorship means we actually can read the things that are happening. And of course, with laws that protect us from data retention, we actually can be protected from retroactive policing. And this, I think, just like the rest of the things I think are important, this is something that is like a talk in itself. When all of the things that you do are recorded, you are so screwed when someone comes looking for information. Because not one person in this room has done something or loaded a web page that didn't load something that couldn't be used against them. The data you, you have in log files around the world, it will tell a story about you which is not necessarily true, but it is made up of facts. And that's in the best case. Because in the worst case, these logs will put people in jail and they're totally forgeable. There's no cryptographic integrity for these things. And that's crazy when you think about it, because these guys can't secure their own computers. How well will they be able to secure their lawful intercept devices? I'm guessing they won't. So everyone's talking about, you know, the state solution is cyber war. Well, I want to talk about the no state solution, right? And I want to reframe it instead of cyber war, I want to talk about peace building. Right? So imagine if instead of trying to build up armaments and build up weapons and break into people's computers and take things or harm them in some way, we assert that we have the right to observe the network that exists, that we interact with, that we have the right to freely speak, to do so anonymously, to be uh, able to do so without fear of serious retribution against ourselves or our family. And we, with this, can make good policy. We can make reasonable debates possible where we can say, okay, maybe there are some times we want to do some of these things which are kind of crazy, but with the right oversight, hopefully, you know, it won't get out of control. Or maybe we realize the data says that it's not possible. You know, if you, if you look at the Stanford prison experiment, we see that totally regular people in a position of power turn into total fascist thugs that commit serious acts of violence. <coughs> If we know that is true about humanity, we have to ask ourselves why we keep repeating that experiment. Right? A really good question. <laughs> Observing these networks is a basic form of human rights observation work. So part of what we're doing at the Tor Project is to actually observe that and to actually see who's filtering and censoring the internet. So we're actually putting up a blog post on Monday about the censorship I mentioned on the Vodafone, the O2, and the T-Mobile networks in the, in the United Kingdom and the United States. Um, so I've got a couple of minutes left, so I'm just going to give you some ideas of some examples. Some people like to call it liberation technology. I think that that is like such massive wankery that I'm not going to 
really say much more than I appreciate that, like open source, we have another term. Um, and we're allies, but maybe, you know, you could just call it free speech, right? It's a, it's a thing. You don't have to call it digital free speech or have anything to do with technology. Someday we'll look at this and think about it like um, horseless buggies, you know? Like, congratulations on your horseless buggy. So this is a web browser where when you visit this web browser uh, and you open it up and you visit this web page in the browser, you see this IP address. This is not the IP address of my computer. And the reason is because it, like many other people, probably around half a million people at any given point in time, it's using Tor. And what does that mean? Well, this is the number of relays. The relays make up the core of the Tor network. So in Australia specifically, we have about 2,600 relays. But in Australia, we've got somewhere around 20, maybe 21 as of yesterday. Those relays, this is the number of users. So in Australia, we see something around like 5,000 users of Tor. So if everybody here emerges Tor or app get installs Tor, you too can be one of these anonymous statistics. And how does it work? Well, basically the way that it works is that you have the ability to tunnel TCP streams. Does everyone here know what TCP is? No? No? OK. How about this? Who here has used the internet? Everybody? Right, all right, great. Glad to hear it. All right. Almost all the time that you use the internet, you make a TCP connection. Easy. All right. So what Tor does is it allows you to make anonymous TCP connections. So Tor relays around the world, like any laptop here can become a Tor relay. They publish to a directory authority. The directory authorities look at each other and say how many Tor relays are around, and then they publish a consensus. Clients connect to these directory authorities. And they say, what's the consensus on what the network looks like this hour? And they, they download that. And then they choose a random set of hops to, to hop through. The first hop knows where you're coming from. They maybe know you're in Australia. The second hop doesn't. The third knows where you're going to, but they don't know who you are, and they don't know where you came from. We call this privacy by design, because by design, the first hop and the third hop have to collude. And you choose at random from that. So as long as you choose one good hop, you're in pretty good shape. And that's, that's really important because it used to be we had to rely on people who say, well, we promise we won't log. Oh, shit, we logged everything. OK, well, we promise we won't give it up to the US government when they ask for it without even going to a judge, maybe. <sighs> Damn, well, we gave it up anyway. All right. No logins, no passwords, no fees. It's all free software. And the network is run with the principles of solidarity and mutual aid. So everybody that wants anonymity runs one of these nodes if they feel like it. They're not forced to. If they feel like it, they contribute. And as a result, they help build an alternative where it doesn't matter what the corporations promise. It doesn't matter if your ISP says, oh, we won't wiretap you or we won't censor you. You don't have to deal with that anymore because you get to this network. And thanks to strong cryptography, the first node, the second node, the third node, and the last, wherever you're going, they all have segmented pieces of information. So it works like this. Trusted directories, those are the servers. Right there, they publish to that. Users talk to the caches, the directories of the servers directly. They build a three hop circuit, as I mentioned. So when Alice wants to talk to Bob, Bob only sees the last hop. So if the EFA in Australia is running this last hop, <coughs> hint, hint, uh, then for example, Bob sees the EFA's Tor node, doesn't see, doesn't see Alice. Alice can say, hey, I'm Alice. But you get something really special here. You get location anonymity. That means that Bob can talk to Alice without knowing where Alice is. So when they go to look up their wiretaps and they go to look up what they've been capturing, it becomes very difficult for them to know what to do. It makes those logs pretty useless, right? So unfortunately, what has happened in a lot of places, for example, in China, is that they actually block access to all of these things. So since they have edge firewalls, they block access, and that's it. You're done. And unfortunately, that's pretty effective. So we designed a thing such that when they're blocking by port number in this way, and they're trying to block access, um, we have this, bridges. So everybody here, instead of running a relay, can run a bridge. That means it's not published in those directories. And it means that when Alice wants to connect to the Tor network, she connects to Bob the bridge first. And Bob the bridge just provides one property, which is access. You don't have to trust it for anything except getting you online. So if you want to help censored users right now that otherwise can't reach the Tor network because they live in an authoritarian, a networked authoritarian state, you install a bridge, you start it up, we distribute it in a way where we don't give everybody the same bridges, 
or you don't give it to us at all, and you just give it out to your friends, and they beat the censorship, and we push them back a little more, and you directly help, right? So you can see, oh, I helped 20 people today on the internet, and you don't learn anything about them except where they were coming from in a geographic sense, and you don't even have to look at that if you don't want to. And so the key from this, the takeaway from this, is that every project can make design, design decisions like this. So anonymity is a norm because we integrate this privacy by design system. So you don't need to teach users about this. For example, if GNOME were to add in use Tor, instead of private browsing modes, you could have a private desktop where everything you do on that desktop is anonymized and it is not trackable to you. You turn it off, it's gone, state's gone, right? Like all the things you had written to your hard drive, maybe you don't write them to the hard drive at all in the first place, but the network doesn't see anything except you talking to Tor. And the Tor network doesn't know that it's you and what you're doing in a way that it can discern, right? So if you're building a chat system, the OLPC guy who was talking yesterday, are you in the room? Yeah. All right, great, check this out. This is an encrypted conversation without my friend or I knowing Say what? Say what? So this right here is an encrypted chat session where I'm talking to a lawyer at the Electronic Frontier Foundation and I said, I'm concerned about NSA wiretapping and I feel that the courts have failed us. Do you think that using off the record is a clear expression of my uh, desire to have privacy? And she says, if that doesn't demonstrate that you have a reasonable expectation of privacy in this conversation, nothing will. Here's the thing, this is the important part. We didn't do anything to make this happen. We verified that it was secure after the fact because automatically when we started a message, it added a couple spaces and tabs and it automated a handshake and it was forward secret. So the only key that's long term is my identity, but the session key is thrown away when we're done with the conversation. No generation of keys, no command line, none of that stuff. Ian Goldberg is a total genius. This is a free software library. This is Pigeon using it. Other people have re-implemented. It's an open standard, it's peer reviewed. And it means that when we're chatting, even if the network is surveilling me, and yes, they can know that I'm talking with this person potentially, they don't know what we're saying. And if we don't log it on our computers, we just beat the surveillance system in a big way. Same thing is true with cell phones. Tech Secure, for example, is OTR for SMS. Almost all of the cell phone carriers that exist on the planet, they record every SMS, they log it, and they put it in a database. At least in the United States, they seem to do that forever on a number of the carriers. They can log this, and they will only see encrypted garbage. And this, just like OTR, sets up automatically when you send it. So if you have an Android phone, who has an Android phone in here? Okay, go to whatever market-like application you have, or to GitHub, and install TechSecure, and when you SMS with other people, it's okay to dick around with your phone now for that. <laughs> I'm okay with that, right? When, when you do this, you push back the surveillance state. You take back some of your agency. Yeah, they can break into your phone and get your keys, but if they didn't know you were interesting before, the recording of the network, we push back the total surveillance. Push it back in a way where they don't have the ability to spy. Moxie Marlinspike that wrote this, total genius, amazing guy. And he made this free software because he, like Ian Goldberg and other people, believe in free software for freedom. This is an example of making the world a much, much better place by just writing some free software. And it's so simple when you think about it. It's a text messaging application, but you regain your autonomy. So now you can say, yeah, I'm gonna go to that party and meet with someone, and you don't have to worry in the same way that you might have if you were concerned about someone knowing that that's happening. So you can say things you were already gonna say, but you can say them without being like, gosh, later someone's gonna read them. So the key here for making these things possible is that they just work automatically after you've installed them. So if Google made that the default text messaging application, people would be so much better off. It would be amazing. Except the carriers and people that want to spy on you without your knowledge, right? Those 250,000 people who were spied on in Australia, I bet not one of them got notice of that. Is that the case that you know of, Scott? Yeah, they don't tell people. You know what's great about that? That means that those people, if they were getting their SMSs monitored, for example, the content of that was probably not included in that. But if the content were included because they decided that the metadata about them, who they were talking to, would have been, then that's it. They wouldn't get that content anymore. And I think that that's good, because if you want to know what I'm saying to someone, you can come and ask me like a reasonable person, and I'll tell you what I think. So. <laughs> Open standards, 
open designs, decentralization over centralization, free software and free hardware. We can make it with free hardware. You know, BDL was talking about the Freedom Box. I would like to think that if we could put together a project to make a free hardware version, so we're not dependent on binary blobs, that we fund people that make free hardware, would you guys get one if we could build one? So do you think, well, we've got about 600 people in the room here, right? Would each of you put in 10 bucks for that, for example? <laughs> All right, so for those of you that said yes, it's good to hear that because we want to make that happen at the Freedom Box Foundation. We want to make that a reality for everybody. So free hardware and free software means that if you want to fab your own, great. We can start being supplied by you if you make it for cheaper. Right? And free software and free hardware allows us to verify, and then it allows us to actually build a better world. When every person has their own mail server in their home, this third-party doctrine where governments get to seize things without your knowledge just goes right out the window because it's hosted in your house. And we have a really good castle doctrine, at least in the West, where breaking into your house has a very high level. I mean, it is the case in the United States that they basically assert, although they don't do so directly, that the only place where you have freedom anymore is in the confines of your house and every communication that radiates out from it, whether it's wired or wireless, that they can get, and usually without a warrant, which is crazy. But knowing that we live in that world, we can roll over and die, or as B-Dale said, slit our throats and give up. But I think he also had the right idea, which is don't do that. Choose to build a better world through free software. Right? So if you want to work in a group that's working for positive change, here's a couple. For example, every free software project in the world. I met a guy this morning who's really very quite funny, uh, and uh, he has a, a file system, a VFS driver, that's called Lib Ferris, as in Ferris Bueller's Day Off, which I think is great, right? You've got to stop and slow down, otherwise the, you know, look around, otherwise the world might pass you by. I think that's a really good uh, file system name. So that free software, that he's working on, it makes the world a better place because it helps people to liberate their data, especially from corporations that betray their users, right? And you can mount Flickr as a file system. It makes it a lot easier to transition off if you want. It allows you to move to other services. It allows you to use your feet or your bits and move them elsewhere. So every free software project makes the world a better place. Even free software projects that work on surveillance, actually, because it's a lot easier to find bugs in their software. <laughs> you know, it's a thought. I think, for example, GNOME, right? The G is for freedom, as Karen was saying. This is great. Imagine a desktop operating system that isn't centered around monetizing your experience. It isn't meant to spy on you. It doesn't collaborate with law enforcement like Microsoft does to build forensics tools to ruin your life. That's amazing. You hack on GNOME, you make the world a better place. You don't have to care about surveillance or security or privacy or any of that stuff because by building alternatives, you help people to liberate their computers and thus to liberate their lives. That's really great. I mean, what Karen is doing and what the rest of the GNOME people are doing is fantastic. And if you want to help with that, if that's where your passion lies, that's a really great thing. Tahoe Least Authority File System, their idea is that you should only trust the cloud for availability. So you encrypt it on the client side and you stuff encrypted bits on the server side. Yeah, so maybe they give your data up to you know, somebody or maybe they get hacked. Who cares, it's encrypted. Right? They're a free software project. They make it so that we can have a, a sort of redundant array of clouds. Obviously, I think the Freedom Box Foundation is doing good stuff. Right? I think a little GNU in the box, isn't that cute? So <laughs> I think it's great. I mean, the, the thing is that you know, this, this project, the idea, the core of this idea is to take these tools that exist and to put them towards a good cause. So if you want to hack on Freedom Box, who here is interested in working on Freedom Box after seeing BDL's talk? Okay, for everybody that didn't raise your hand, the reason that you should be considering to work on Freedom Box, if you aren't already, is because everybody in the world, not one person excluded, will have access to the kind of computer systems that all of us take for granted, and access to the networks that have built our lives and made them better. If you want to work on something like that, if that seems like a reasonable goal, you can make it happen. I mean, there are lots of people that get paid to work on free software because of the merit of their contributions is very valued by lots of people. And that, you know, maybe that doesn't convince you. But it's important to know that your work will really matter, really, really, really matter to a lot of people. I think also, for example, the ADA, the ADA initiative is really important, right? I think what Val and other people have done
I think what they've done is, is, is fantastic, right? They're trying to create a safe space. You don't have to worry about dissidents in another country. We have a group of people in our own culture, approximately 50% of the population, which is regularly oppressed, right? And they, they do so because the systems of patriarchy are really, really a part of our societies around the world. And what they're doing is they're saying, you don't have to go far away to make the world a better place. You can do it with your actions. You can do it with your thought and with your speech. So what they're doing is great. If nothing else, you should just give them some money so they can tell people that message, so we can have a consciousness-raising effort happening all over the world. And I, I really respect what they're doing, and I think the logo is fantastic. Noise Tour is a group of people that are working on um, deploying Tor relays at high volumes. Um, if you have a data center, for example, and you might like to toss up a Tor relay, these guys will sysadmin the box so that, you know, Tor traffic will flow from it and you don't have to think about it. They're just one of many. Torservers.net also is running Tor relays so that people can have capacity without having to have, say, a lot of sysadmin time on their desktop computer. Until the Freedom Box is going, this is a pretty good way, I think, to, to have lots of high capacity relays. And it's done by the NoiseBridge hackerspace in San Francisco. Um, so you can definitely, if you want, you can help with that. And of course, if you haven't, you should, especially if you're in Australia, you should consider supporting the EFA. Because the EFF in my country has basically made it so that cryptography is legal. It, it, they have created, yeah, a round for them, right? And as a result, it means that the cryptography that, that, that they have helped to export, to relax those restrictions, those people, they are not alone in their struggle. What EFA is doing is in the same spirit, and it's very important to support them because if you don't have people that understand technology talking to policymakers, policymakers only have people that understand how they benefit from technology. We don't want that. That's how we end up with the SOPA. That's how we end up with uh, the PIPA. That's how we end up with whatever fascist uh, you know, law that they're coming up with today to restrict our right to read and our freedom of speech. So EFA, I think, is right on the front lines here in Australia. So who here is an EFA member? Anybody? If you're not raising your hand, you should fix that. You should join the EFA because they're doing awesome, awesome work. And in fact, they're part of the reason that I'm here, along with Scott and, and Josh from LCA. You know, they made sure that I would be able to get past the border. Right? I mean, that's really awesome. So thanks to them for making this happen. And if you want to come hack on tour, we're always looking for good security people or anonymity people or people that just want to learn to program and want to work on something great. So with that, I've taken up approximately 20 minutes more of your time than I was supposed to. Oh, thanks. I appreciate it. But it's really been quite an honor. I've always wanted to come to LCA. So I don't know if I have time for questions and answers. Um, but if you want to ask me some questions, now's the time, I think. And I was just going to say, we, we might wrap it up formally. Uh, but if people would like to stay and do questions, that's fine too. Uh, but we'll break it up for morning tea officially. But a big round of applause. Thank you. Jeff. I hope everyone had a good time at the Penguin Dinner last night, uh, for those who attended. I think it was fairly enjoyable. Um, I'd just like to give um, one quick mention once again to Mary Gardner, uh, the recipient of the Rusty Wrench Award last night. Uh, I think if we could just give her another round of applause for her fantastic efforts, that'd be great. So a few quick things for the day. I'll start off with the most completely boring thing that an announcer can do and state that if you own car UUW152 in the car park, your lights are on. Um, uh, okay, a couple of announcements. Um, the raffle will be drawn this afternoon. Um, today and this morning in particular is your last chance to get tickets for that fantastic MakerBot. Um, so we'll be drawing that in the closing session today. Um, the lightning talks will be starting at 3.20 today, um, and we'll be advising in a second who won those. Uh, sorry, the, the lightning talks, yeah, 3.20. Um, the best ofs will be announcing just in a moment who won those. Uh, the photo clomp closes at 1 o'clock. Um, please have all your entries in uh, by then. We will be advising who the winner of that one is 
uh, in this closing session as well, and there's a, a pretty great prize for them. Um, I've been asked to, to advise that the LCA, Birds of a Feather, is in Studio 2 at lunchtime for anyone silly, uh, brave enough to want to think about running an LCA. Um, it, it's very rewarding, I promise. Um, there will be a feedback survey going out. <laughs> uh, there will be a feedback survey going out to everyone. Um, if we could get you to, to fill that one out, it does help improve LCA year upon year. Um, a couple of other little things. Um, there is a love barbecue tomorrow uh, the, for Linux users Victoria. Uh, I believe the details were being handed out as you came in the door, so we'd love to, to see as many people at that as possible. Um, the weather today, 26, partly cloudy, wind 15 to 20 kilometres an hour, probably the most comfortable day we've had all week, which is, which is a nice way to end. So, the votes are in for the best ofs, and we have four amazing talks from four amazing speakers happening this afternoon. <laughs> Having not seen any talks this week, um, I, I'm really relying upon feedback that I see on Twitter and from, from people that I speak to in the corridors. Uh, these are the four talks and these are the four names that I've heard the most throughout the week. So it's great to see that the voting does line up with those. Um, yeah, that they'll be kicking off at 20 past three this afternoon uh, and that will be published on the schedule fairly shortly. 20 past one, sorry. Um, okay, we have just a couple more prizes to give away too. Um, give me my first. We have the final of these Intel SSDs. Identity and post them online so that people know about it. I think that's really important. So <clears throat> another thing that I think is important is to counter a sort of 90s nihilism. If I was, if I was going to you know, have to point it out, I think that would probably be the way to frame it, which is that people like to think that they, uh, they don't have anything to hide. And I think that's pretty fantastic, um, specifically because it usually comes from a position of privilege. You hear it in the geek community a lot, like, oh, I don't like to be political. What they mean is, I'm OK with the status quo, usually because they're white male. And they're making it. And they're loaded with cash. <laughs> Almost every lady clapped except for Karen. Come on, Karen. Oh, OK. All right. She opened by saying she had a big heart. I was going to open by saying, I have a large mouth. <laughs> we all have our special organs. <laughs> so <clears throat> that, that one's mine. <clears throat> so I think it's really important to note that we don't have to think about it in the terms of it not happening to you. It's happening to you right now. So for example, who here has a cell phone? Raise your hand if you have a cell phone. Congratulations. As the senator said last night, you have a tracking device that can make phone calls. Right? That's the way to recontextualize it. For example, he also said last night that while he was reviewing the wiretapping for this country, he said that there's been you know, a couple thousand requests for content of information. And that sounds maybe right for the size of the population. But he said that there's also been a quarter of a million requests for so-called metadata. So that's like your location, for example, where you are right now. So everybody in this room could be covered in that. And they could be getting your data in real time. Maybe that counts as a one. I think that that's pretty, that's pretty crazy. But it doesn't include the spy agencies. So that means it doesn't include your equivalent of the NSA. That's really scary to think that 250,000 of those requests went out last year. I mean, it's probably the case that you are actually someone in this room, certainly me, is definitely, <laughs> is definitely up here. And with the fact that the borders are surveilled, Everybody when you transit, you know, who used a root name server that wasn't in Australia today? Raise your hand. Yeah, okay, congratulations, you were probably surveilled too. And this is, I mean, this is a really important thing. It's like, okay, who cares about it? Well, it turns out that, that Dr. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's good. So Dr. Kelly Kane from the, uh, from the University of Indiana, who I love dearly, is totally fantastic. She talks about this in terms of how people cope with the psychology of being surveilled. And I'm not going to go too much into her research, but just an interesting point is that people actually do this as a coping strategy. If you recognize it's a coping strategy, it's not unlike how a lot of women have to deal with abuse in the technical community, which is total bullshit, and they shouldn't have to deal with it. And it's really important to note that this is a coping strategy that we take when our state abuses us. We say, oh, it's not going to happen to us, or, oh, I don't have... Do we have in the crowd an Anne Day? 
Ooh, there's Anne. Thank you. Whilst Anne's making her way to the front, I'll say that we have a final Samsung Galaxy Tab to give away this morning with screen protector. <laughs> well done, Anne. And the winner of the tab is Andrew Cowie. <laughs> Don't forget your screen protector! Quick! You cannot save the world without a screen protector. So, we are of course here this morning for our final keynote of Linux.com.au 2012. Uh, and standing beside me is, is that keynote speaker. Um, he's a renowned internet security professional uh, who works for the University of Washington uh, in their security and privacy laboratory. He's a core developer for the Tor project, which I'm sure most of you would be familiar with. Uh, he was part of the team behind the cold boot attacks um, and won a Pawnee for the most innovative research award. Uh, he was also part of the MD5 collision team uh, that managed to create a rogue CA certificate. Um, he is Mr. Jacob Applebaum. First, I'll start off by plugging in my laptop so you can see the presentation that I worked on until late into the evening. Huh? Maybe not. Set up this. Ah! It's a live demo fail already. Okay, so I'm here to talk to you today about surveillance and censorship, and it's quite an honor to be invited all the way down here. It was quite a long trip. Um, I had the opportunity to visit several airports along the way. I never knew that when I went to Australia, that meant I would also visit Los Angeles. So thanks for that. Thanks for bringing me here. Um, I really appreciate that. Um, I wonder, are there any DSD agents in the audience? If you could just raise your hand. Anybody? Come on, be proud of it, you know? Expose their secrets, protect your own. Um, so I want to start by saying that what Bruce Pern said on his keynote is really right on, which is that free software is really important, and specifically Richard Stallman's that this was the case. Before, we had countless studies that actually showed that that's the case. So if we fast forward a couple hundred years, we can actually see what the Panopticon looks like, at least in the United States. <laughs> right? I mean, it started off small, and it got big, and it got worse, and I'm going to talk about that. So this is San Francisco. They, the AT&T ran a really great campaign, right? AT&T works in more places like NSA headquarters, for example. <laughs> the Billboard Liberation Front liberated this in San Francisco. It was this, it was this afterwards. Um, this is important because AT&T collaborated to perform what generally we would consider to be an illegal action, which is that they wiretapped the entire traffic, internet traffic and telephone traffic, going through a bunch of their exchanges. We know that it happened at Second and Folsom in San Francisco because Mark Klein, an employee of AT&T, told the world. And we know that this is happening because the EFF you know, speaking of other amazing people, the EFF spoke up and filed suit about this. And the US government said, well, you know, it's not really a problem because everybody was wiretapped, so nobody was really harmed. <laughs> right. So I don't know about you guys, but I find that to be pretty disturbing. In fact, I find it to be so disturbing that I, you know, I felt quite sad. You know, Obama said that he was going to uh, close Guantanamo Bay, and he was going to do a bunch of other stuff like hold the Bush administration accountable for, you know, their crimes against humanity. Well, you know, warrantless wiretapping and general warrants, it pales in comparison to being murdered by U.S. bombs. No question. But the fact of the matter is, Obama hasn't even done anything about this. And that's really sad to me. And I, I want to like the guy, but I don't anymore, which is too bad. And this, this pretty much is something that I feel like everyone has to deal with this, but nobody really understands how bad the problem is. Partially because, just as the US said that no one was harmed, 
They also say that they're not going to tell anybody how it was done. So for example, it is, it is certainly the case that other intelligence agencies in other countries also spy on their own, at least the edges. For example, in Sweden, the FRA law says, we get to wiretap the borders of the country and then they get to do analysis on it. Now, Sweden is unique in that they actually codified this in law. So they said, we're going to wiretap everybody, and it's a law, and we're going to tell you how it works. Now, that's quite a nice dedication to the rule of law, but there's something to be said about how it's still tyranny, even if it's legal. And, and I think that that's also an important point. So here's how it happened in, in, in the United States. This is the splitter that they put into a room. This is the room. This is the, another view of the room. So just to go back. So it doesn't take much to be able to wiretap San Francisco. And that's really important, especially because this is you know, a major center of the internet in terms of what people are doing online. So everybody that visited something that transited through San Francisco or any of the other NSA TNT locations, they probably went through a room like this. We only really know about this room for sure, and we only have pictures of this one. I'd like to have better pictures if you happen to work in one of these facilities anywhere, especially in Australia. You should take these pictures and you should make sure to very carefully conceal your ideas and what he's been writing about. He's a genius. I mean, someone asked me yesterday if I was on a crusade and I said, no, I'm not religious, but I realized if we had a prophet, it would be RMS. <laughs> And, and specifically, I realized it in a sort of, oh, shit, we're doomed sort of sense, <laughs> right? So we just know that he's really good at telling us how doomed we are. And he has some ideas about what we might be able to do to make it a little bit more livable. But it's, it's certainly not the case that he has come up with a bunch of perfect solutions. In fact, what he did is he came up with some ideas that allow us to maybe find a good first approximation of some solutions. So it's, I think, pretty different than a religious zealot. But there are definitely some parallels that make me think maybe I should call up Robert Anton Wilson and ask him what I should believe in. But um, <clears throat> that said, Richard Stallman is really important. And if you use the term open source software, I would really urge you to use the term free software instead. Because free software is about freedom. I know that Bruce likes to talk about how important it is to put on a suit and tie and to talk about business and so on. But the thing is that at the end of the day, we have to talk about what we want those businesses to actually accomplish. And what I want to see those businesses accomplish is to actually promote human rights and to actually make the world a better place, right? So free software for freedom, not open source for business solutions. And I think that's really important. They can coexist together, but free software for freedom is the goal. We're allies, but we should always keep that in mind. And so that's sort of the opener there. And from that, I'm going to jump in and I'm going to talk about some really bad news. So basically, we live in a surveillance society. I said state. And the reason is because we don't really live in different states. We live in maybe little different surveillance cones. And those different surveillance cones, they usually trade with each other. Some of you have probably heard about a thing called Echelon. Anybody here? Raise your hand if you have. Yeah, yeah of course, right? Um, so the UK-USA pact, right? This idea that you know, the United Kingdom, Canada, um, New Zealand, Australia, these, these countries, they work together, they spy on each other's citizens, and they trade that information, because it would be illegal for them to spy on their own citizens. So it's kind of a hack, right? So the thing is that what that practically means is that we live in a surveillance planet, right? The whole planet is surveilled in different ways. And I think that's really concerning to me, and I hope it's concerning to everybody else. Now, what can we do about that? Um, well, I'm not sure, but I'm going to get there. First, I'm going to talk a little bit about what, what it means to live in a surveillance state. So in 1785, Jeremy Bentham talked about this idea of the panopticon. And he, he said, you know, here's a prison where you can have a single guard in the middle, and every prisoner feels like they're being watched. So they actually become their own guards. So he observed hundreds of years ago that it was the case that when people felt like they were being surveilled, their behavior would be modified. That's a really important observation to make, because it shows, in fact, that even hundreds of years ago, we were able to, to see 